OK, uh, thanks for the introduction, and thanks for having me. And uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ye. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about growth design architecture. And more importantly, I cover some research problems we met, and in general, maybe in layer two space, which hopefully can be interesting for some research students. And uh, so before diving into more detail, just a quick introduction of, of us. So in short, Scroll is a scaling solution for Ethereum. And uh, in other words, uh, we are building a general purpose layer two platform that enhances security from Ethereum, but can be much cheaper, faster with a higher throughput. And uh, technically speaking, more specifically, we are building something called EVM equivalent ZK rollup. So firstly, it's a ZK rollup solution. It's considered to be the most secure scaling solution based on zero knowledge proof. And second, we can support EVM inside our ZK rollup. So it's general purpose. And also it's not specifically targeting one programming language like Solidity, but we can support anything that uh, is ported around EVM, including the debuggers and all the toolings around. So for developers, you can reuse all the toolings around and the development experience will be exactly the same as Ethereum. And that's exactly what we want. So in today's talk, there will be mainly four parts. Firstly, I will start with some background and motivation, and then I will quickly go through the architecture of Scroll. Um, and third, I will, I will like, you know, maybe we can we can build it even from scratch in this talk. And finally, cover some interesting research problem, both on the protocol design side and the cryptographic side. Okay, so let's start with the traditional diagram of layer one. So users send the transactions and it will be broadcasted in a P2P network and uh, miners or validators will submit this block. Then everyone will download this block and re-execute all the transactions inside this block to reach some consensus. And this is how you're working in, in layer one. And uh, then like, you know, this is for every 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 block you need to download and re-execute. So all the full nodes need to do the same thing for every single block. And suppose that, you, that you, your network is sufficiently decentralized, you have maybe 1 million nodes in your network, and they need to do the exactly the same type of computation over and over again. And it's clearly redundant and inefficient, but this is exactly what brings you this like, you know, security and decentralization guarantees, right? And uh, so the idea behind the Zikirap is that Okay, so instead of broadcasting all the transactions on congested and expensive layer one P2P network, you will send all the transactions to an off-chain and centralized layer two node. And this node will process all those transactions and generate a very small and succinct proof pi, saying that, okay, so all those end transactions are valid. And then layer one only need to verify this very succinct proof instead of re-executing all the transactions. So the magic here actually happens on the owner proof because it can compress a huge amount of computation, a batch of transactions into a small and more importantly, publicly verifiable proof. And so imagine that layer one still can only process 10 transactions per second, but each transaction is verifying a proof, which can be you know, compressed maybe once on the transactions. So here is the magic. But it's really non-trivial to build such a zk system for many reasons. One is that to generate proof for a certain type of computation, you firstly need to write all your program logic using automatic circuit. It's very, very complicated. And think about the world where you can't use like, you know, for loop, AFLs, all those high level program syntax, but you can only use some math assertions with additions and modifications. And uh, also like each program need to be fixed ahead of time because, you know, for each different application, you need to build a different circuit. And uh, so that's the biggest problem. One of the biggest problems for ZKRAP in the past, because you know the idea seems amazing, but two years ago, ZKRAP can only handle payments and swap because you can only build for specific logic. And uh, it's Im impossible for every solid developer to write such a circuit to scale their application. And let alone like, you know, after you write this, you, you need to pass some very rigid secure auditing. And the worst still, like even if you get like, you know, very strong teams and they, they build like some ZK apps for their own application, and uh, every 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 like the Kira posts their their state 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 root and some proof and their data on chain. There's still no compatibility because you can't prove proof for like dynamic sequence of circuits in one proof. Like you know, if this is proving for Uniswap, this is proving for Awe. You can't just you know like you know compose two two different two two different circuits very easily, and uh, because each different different circuit different prover may have different on chain verifier with different smart contract, or maybe like you. you you can do that, but you need some definitely need some more specialized system. And that's exactly what we want to solve. We want compatibility, and we don't want to like the developer to touch those math in, inside the ZK proof. So instead of proving for application specific logic, we are actually proving on the EVM level with a shared global state as Ethereum layer one. And to build such a general purpose ZK rollup, we need to generate proof for arbitrary type of EVM transactions. And that's exactly why we need this something called ZK EVM. It's a very popular word recently. And uh, so the idea behind ZK EVM is that it can prove a batch of EVM transactions 
using the uh, proof, using a statistics and validity proof pi. And technically speaking, it's composed of a set of circuits. And with all those circuits, you can prove the correct execution of EVM. And uh, so you can you can handle any EVM type of transactions. So uh, different from previously, now your smart contract is only part of the input to this EVM circuit. It will interpret and prove each execution step over EVM. Um, you know, but but there are clearly drawbacks of the EVM and why people are not mentioning that even two years ago. One reason is that because it's so hard to build, right? So like think of all, like in building a ZK Rapid is already hard and building a ZK EVM is much, much harder. So I can shortly explain why. So first the reason is that EVM has very limited of support of utility curves because EVM is handling some on-chain smart contract games. It can't, for example, you can't use cyclic utility curve. You need some specialized pre compiles for, for different verification algorithm. So this limits your choice for proving algorithm, right? Because you can't use arbitrary proving algorithm with, with even like lower complexity verify algorithm because it might be expensive running on EVM. And secondly, that EVM has a word size of 256. So this will blow up the whole circuit a lot because, you know, think of the, if you are familiar with zonal proof, you know that there is a prime, there is a like, you know, native field or usually to be, usually a prime field for uh, for witness. And if your your your, your field used is, diff, is, is, is not matched with this native field, then you need range proof everywhere, which will blow up the, maybe the circuit for 100 times because, you know, each range proof introduced, like, you know, you, you need to decompose into bitwise and do a lot of things like that. And thirdly is that EVM has a lot of special opcodes, for example, like catch check, right? So because do we, doing bitwise operations in ZK is super hard and catch check involves too many bitwise operations and sometimes maybe dynamic. And uh, so it has, like EVM has calls, has error handling. It just has so many things that is EVM unfriendly. It needs many special functions like RLP encoding and things like that. It just makes the circuit design become really, really complicated. And it's so, let alone like, you know, it has a very large, uh, like, um, like complicated storage. Because, you know, the, if you are familiar with ECM, you know that the storage is relying on data structure called Markov potential tree. And it's totally built using Kachak. Um, and also like EVM is a stack-based virtual machine where SNARK, SNARK natively is better suitable for some register-based virtual machine. Um, and uh, usually like this machine-based proof has a gigantic overhead because you don't know like which opcode you are executing during the, the runtime. So people usually think it's even impossible to implement such a stuff in the past. Like, you know, it's, it's impossible. So we, we have to build something application specific. But recently the re like, you know, new, new breakthroughs in, in cryptographic uh, like you especially improving system makes this possible. Um, uh, just a quick like intuition for why. Like first is polynomial commitment. So in the past, if you think about like, you know, what's the most popular proving system is Growth 16, which relies on this RNCS and bilinear pairing. And, uh, but the problem of that is that each constraint can be, the, the degree of each constraint can only be two because you need bilinear pairing in your verification. So you can only multiply two group elements in, on the exponent. So you can't read that to arbitrary degree. So your, your, your constraint system is limited in, in some sense, but with polynomial commitment, you can read your constraints to arbitrary like degree. And, uh, and also like more importantly, this brings you some like universal and transparent like property, which makes that, you know, really convenient for building applications for building like different circuits. And second is called lookup and custom gates. It's two different types of optimizations, which I will like just introduce later. But those two optimizations make you know, when you're writing the circuit for EVM, it's really convenient because lookup can easily handle some RAM, which is verifiable read and write from by reading, by having a table and just looking looking up elements into that table. And the custom gate is something what I described just now is like, you know, you can write some high degree constraints. And third, and uh, you know, using lookup and the custom gate, you, you can make your representation for EVM in circuit, maybe like, you know, one or two order of magnitude smaller than before. And the third is called hardware acceleration because, you know, prover is definitely costly, but the good thing for, for proving algorithm is that it's highly parallelable, which means you can use GPU, IPG, or ASIC to make, make this, you know, really parallelable proving process become significantly faster. And with hardware acceleration, you can make, you know, practically you can make, make your proof generation time to be like, you know, one or two order of magnitude faster. And fourth is that there is the recursive proof, which can further reduce your on-chain verification cost. Yeah, so those are like, you know, four major reasons why like ZKR might be like, you know, three order of magnitudes more efficient than like two years ago. And that, that's the reason why it makes ZKVM possible. And just- to, yeah, yeah, are you going to talk about the specific custom gates that you're using? 
yes, yes, I will, I will. Like, okay. and also all the concepts behind, like, you know, I will have, it's a very informative talk, yeah. Okay, great, great, yeah, I'll okay. wait. Yeah, um, and so there are three different flavors, uh, flavors like for the EVM by, by or classified by Justin Drake. So there is first level, which is language level. So basically, your your your, your target is solidity or your it's, it's some like EVM EVM language. Um, and the idea is that you know uh, you can write some customized compiler to compile solidity to some customized instruction set, and you design some more friendly ZK virtual machine to execute those. ZK friendly instructions. Um, and so it's, it's this virtual machine is different from EVM, but it somehow be compatible with Solidity because you can still compile that into your new virtual machine and prove that the execution for that virtual machine. And this is approach taken by MetaLab and Starkware. Um, the, the good thing for that is that you can choose something to be ZK friendly and you don't need to afford all the overhead that brings by EVM. And second level is bytecode level. So, which means you know we are not targeting at one specific language, but we are targeting at Solidity. We are not we are targeting at EVM bytecode directly, and we, we need to prove that EVM bytecode is, is executing correctly directly. So, it, which means you know we are a lower level compatibility with with all the toolings around because it's not only on this language side. So this this approach is taken by us, Polygon Hermes, and the consensus. And finally, there is something called consensus level, which is really hard because you need to reach. Uh, Ethereum equivalent. So on the backlog level, you can call that EVM equivalent is because it's more on the execution side. But on the consensus level, you even to need to reach the exactly the same implementation as Ethereum itself, and finally achieve this goal of they can snark everything and snark your blockchain. And so we are on the like middle level. And now, like second, I will firstly go go through the architecture of Scroll, like you know how this overflow work and how we architecture our our ZK app. And next, I will move to ZK part, which might be more interesting for for you guys. Um, and so intuitively for ZK app, like as I mentioned, like you send all the transactions to a layer two node, and this layer two node will run some proving algorithm, some easy proof and data. So intuitively, there will be should be several components. One is called sequencer, which after receiving those transactions, you need to sequence those transactions and generate layer two blocks. And there is a relayer in between because sometimes user deposits from layer one and also user withdraw from layer two. So you need to relay messages between layer one and layer two for some transactions and put that also in, into the sequencer when you are sequencing transactions. And also you, you need to relay proofs and data. So, and after sequencer generating this block, prover will generate proof for each block. And more importantly, one important piece in our architecture is that the prover is not centralized. So we designed a decentralized prover network, which means in our node, we implement something called a coordinator. We are not, so in the past, they could you to like just run a, a cluster by themselves and uh, running this proof generation in a centralized way. But to incentivize the more active prover market and open like this, this competition for, for prover, prover market, we make this decentralized prover network, which means anyone can run their, their, their run using their, their hardware and connect to our, our network and generate proof. So this is something called decentralized prover network. Um, so basically you, in this way, you can incentivize this open proving market. Like people can use GPU, people can use IPG, or eventually they can be incentivized to really have ASIC to make this proof generation faster. And uh, yeah, so this is one important piece, which is specifically and unique to our architecture. And now let's take a deeper look at the workflow. So the workflow of ZKRAP is that, okay, so you can generate block really fast and a batch of transactions and process on chain. And uh, so, but, but this you really need to wait for a longer time because proof generation usually takes, you know, more than like maybe sometimes even 30 minutes. Um, so like, you know, the, the finality on layer one usually take a longer time. So, but what we observe is that, you know, this block data actually can be, can be committed before you, you you generate the validated proof and which you know user can get some faster on-chain confirmation. So in our design, like we have three different stages. So after user sending transactions to our to our node, uh, you will even into a stage called pre-committed. So this usually take one to two seconds. So you can get very fast or even instant like pre-committed state. And if you believe in us, then you can already use this state as a confirmation. And then after a short period of time, which is usually minutes, and then we, we, we will commit block data on chain. And this usually take minutes. And this, uh, like, you know, users can, you know, even you don't trust us, you can say this in first order or in first like transaction order through through layer one contract and which is a uh, like more firm confirmation. Uh, and then your, your blocks, like, you know, your transaction status move to this committed. And then after a while, like you, we will submit the proof. And which means you your 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 transaction finally get get 
finalized on layer one. So this usually takes more than 10 minutes. It's include the proof generation time, but sometimes it differs because it's not only influenced by this proof generation time, because if you have a, a lower throughput in your network, it's usually take a longer time because, uh, you know, because you need to wait for a longer batch to, to make this, you know, proof um, like verification to be amortized over a larger batch of transactions to be like more, uh, like to be cheaper. So this is like, you know, um, how, how, how it works on our scroll sticky rollup. And we build a specialized rollup explorer showing this block status. And we have live test net and feel free to, to try that and uh, like figure out, you know, what's their transaction like uh, status. So there, there is pre-committed, which is a few seconds ago. There's a committed usually like, you know, minutes ago. And uh, there is like finalized after like, you, you know, maybe 10 minutes or, or 20 minutes, depending on your, your throughput and also like how many provers you have in your network. So this is a, uh, a quick go through for architecture for like, you know, how we design the whole architecture of scroll. And now I will talk more about the ZK part and what's the exact circuit optimization we are using and how you are using those optimization to build your ZK circuits. So um, also feel free to, to stop me if I'm like, you know, talking too fast. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So to build a ZK EVM and write all those circuits, we firstly need to understand what's the exact computation we need to prove. So let's take a deeper look at what's happening on the node side. So we start with some initial like you know word state and you have some root and then after you receiving this 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 transaction um and uh, the node will run this transaction over evm evm is a stack based virtual machine as i mentioned it will load the so for example your transaction interacting with with uniswap it will load this corresponding smart contract bytecode to memory and execute the this 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 bytecode opcode by opcode with this transaction as your input and then like you were resulting uh, some execution trace like this. So the execution trace is composed of a sequence of opcodes that has been executed on EVM. So for this specific transaction, maybe this trans tran execution look like this, but for, for a different transaction, it, it's different. And at the same time during execution, because EVM will write to the storage. So you are resulting a different like state root prime. So um, to build a ZK EVM, um, Let's take a look at you know like how the EVM kicking during this process. Since the computation you need to prove is the ECM virtual machine, so you will use EVM as your computational spec for defining all those constraints. So basically, for example, you have constraints for opcode you are executing, you have constraints for bytecode, you have constraints for storage, and all those stuff. And then your public int for the EVM should be your old state and your new state and the set of transactions you have applied. So because for for every you know like uh, then a proof scheme you are using uh, for every application, you need to have a clear statement for like, you know, uh, clarifying what, what you need to prove. So for the EVM, um, it's saying that, uh, hey, applying all those own transactions, your state root from move from root to root point. And the verifier then to know, need to know the concrete execution trace and how it's executed. And uh, so, uh, but inside your, your ZKVM logic, uh, you need to prove that you use this execution trace as your witness to prove for this consistency. And with, with this, like, you know, this initial state transactions, um, you need to prove that, you know, this execution trace is uniquely unrolled from this transaction and it's valid. So by saying valid, I mean, like every, every computational step uh, is doing the correct computation and they read and write are consistent. Like, you know, you push some elements and then you pop those two elements are the same. Okay. Now, uh, after we have a better understanding of, of the EVM and how, like, you know, what's high level, what, what the EVM is proving. Now let's dive deeper into like, you know, maybe what, what you really care about, like how to write constraints um, and what's the optimization used inside. So we are using something called Plunkish optimization. So it's different. It's quite different from RNCS in terms of like, you know, uh, so think of RNCS. So it, the, the form for RNCS is that you got some linear combination for your, for your, for your, for your witness, witness variable times linear combination for your witness equal to linear combination for, for some witness, uh, like, you know, scalar. Um, and uh, you, you have multiple constraints like that. And so the, the way like you are thinking of this layout is that you have a long vector, which containing all your witness, and then you prove some li like linear relationship for those vector and your degree of each constraint can only be one. So those are layout as a vector, but you can access any elements. But for Planck, uh, it's, diff it's quite different. You are not layouting all your witness just as a vector, but you are you are layouting that in a table. So this is basically how it look like. You you can imagine that you when you have a program and then you fill up all your all your like you know values used 
uh, when you are running this program inside, like, you know, you, you fill up your input here and all the, like, you know, values in the middle here. And then like what you can do is that in, in Plunky certification is that you can define something called a custom gate. So this custom gate look like this. You can select a certain area, like for example, you, you, can, you can select something very irregular, like something like this. And you can define that, okay, so V3 times VB3 times VC3 minus VB4 equal to zero. So you can basically define arbitrary relationship for, for this. So this is something called a gate. And uh, you can define arbitrary shape. You can define arbitrary relationship with arbitrary, like, you know, you, you can define higher degree. And uh, so different from RNCS, as I mentioned, it's higher degree and it's more customized. So it's, it's very useful, especially for some, some program, because for example, if you are thinking of some, um, some, some program which has some fixed pattern, like, you know, it's repeated multiple times and you can abstract that pattern using this custom gate. And uh, you can just use very few custom gate to represent all your program logic, use very like fewer uh, constraints. Um, instead of, you know, you, you, in RNCS, you have to use everything like, you know, uh, in, in one, like one application is one, one constraint. And uh, uh, you can define arbitrary shape of custom gates look like this, or even like this. And uh, you can define arbitrary shape, like relationship. And another thing you can define in Plunker customization is called permutation. So because uh, imagine that you define this gate, you define this gate, and, uh, but you need to, you know, generate some relationship for those gates. Like you need to connect different gates together. Like, you know, this gate's output equal to the, the next gate's input, right? So what you can define is that something called permutation. So permutation can define, you know, a set of elements are equal. Like for example, VB4 equal to VC, VC6, equal to VB6, equal to VA, VA6. So this is something you can define in permutation. It's usually you to link different custom gates and, uh, and doing something like that. So this is a second optimization you can use, which is basically you can define some column and define some, you know, this permutation mapping like inside those columns. Um, and the third thing you can define is called lookup arguments. So what you can prove here is that you can prove a, a, a certain tuple belongs to a table. So for example, like V7, VB7, VC7 belongs to this table, like T0, T1, and T2. And uh, so why this is useful, like, because it looks like pretty similar to this membership membership proof, um, but it's very useful in practice, in, especially in, in, in our ZK EVM. So I will give you an example. So if you want to prove that VC7 belongs to this range, like zero to, to 15, then like, you know, what you do, you, you can do in RNCS is that you can decompose this into bitwise and you, you write maybe like 16 constraints to constrain. So first each bit is zero or one, and then you linear combine and equal to this VC7. But now you can just iterate all the, all the possible entries from zero to one, 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 one. And then you just prove that this VC7 belongs to this table. And then definitely it belongs to this, this range. And you can do like, uh, some like bitwise operations really efficiently. And bitwise operation is due to be a biggest problem for, for ZK user in practice, like in the past. But basically, if you want to prove that V7, uh, like, you know, XOR VB7 equal to VC7, then you just, you know, brute force all the possible entries inside this table and prove that this belong to this. And this is especially useful for the KVM because using this lookup relationship, you can define some RAM operation. So basically in previous operation, you can even like, you can, you can even generate a dynamic table. So in previous operation, you can write to this table and then in later operation, you can read from this table and then prove that they are consistent using this, the same table. And it's generated on the fly. So that's something I call RAM in, in a virtual machine, a machine-based proof system. So those are like constraints you can write in Planck's optimization. So this is the first type is custom gate. The second type is permutation. And the third type is something called lookup. So any questions so far? Or is that- um, Wait, actually, can you, can, you, can you say, I mean, traditional lookup, in traditional lookup, the table is fixed ahead of time. Yes. Uh, what, so what do you mean by writing to the table and reading from the table? Yeah, so yeah, so that's a good question. So if you think of this, like, you know, uh, if, if you are only proving for for this range proof, then like you know this column is definitely fixed, or some bitwise operation, this is definitely fixed. But uh, what I'm saying this dynamic lookup table. If so, if you think of the initial lookup arguments, or even plookup or the lookup arguments in Plunky two, it's actually done to enforce you force this 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 column to be fixed. It's just basically proving that you know this polynomial. Uh, this the, the evaluation points of this polynomial uh, belonging to the evaluation points of this polynomial. So it's basically defining relationship over polynomials. It's not like, you know, this column have to be fixed. And uh, so that's why, like, you know, you can make this, like, you know, when you are 
So, so this table can be part of the, the, the witness you are using. And then you can prove that, you know, those two columns have those relationship. If I don't know whether I explained that clearly or no, not. No, but I, they, I, I see, I see. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Good, yeah, good. yeah. So, so basically you can make this, this table become dynamic, like, you know, like, yeah, um, yeah. I can cover some examples if we have time, like later. If you know, that's yeah, that's more important. And, and and why did you separate them into table one and table two? Is it just because of the dimensions? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe it's used for different, like you know, usage, right? Because this table is used for XOR. This table might be used for like you know, uh, fixed uh -huh. lookup for some range. And this lookup maybe if you use for some RAM operation, you definitely don't want to, you know, because you are looking for specific relationship in specific table, right? So you have one one to one mappings. And sometimes, you know, a magic operation you can do is that you can stack uh, and optimizations. You can do is that you can stack some like you know lookup tables together because for example this lookup table might be just two powers like 16 or two powers like whatever like length and if your circuit longer you can actually stack two different lookup tables and add one column as tag and then you can look up through different tags and uh, you know do some you know lookup table compression yeah that's some optimizations but basically why you have different tables because you have different functionalities yep good okay oh uh, any more questions so far Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. So now let's look at the how you build an EVM circuit from scratch. So as I explained earlier, to prove that a transaction is valid, we need to prove that this execution trace of this transaction is valid, right? So and uh, as I mentioned, like previously, what you can do in Planckage optimization is that you imagine that you have a large table and you fill up this table with with some witness, and then you define some customized relationships for those for those like you know witness. And uh, so the the actually the information in this trace here is not enough. It needs much more like information. So the first thing you need to do is that unrolling this execution trace into a larger execution trace table with more information inside as witness. So more information than just the opcode you are executing. I can I, I will show some examples later. And then like you need to write some constraints over this table to prove that to step one executing to step n are correctly uh, are correct and are consistent. So now let's take a deeper look at the witness you need in each step. So there are three different type, type of witness. So there is step context, there are case switch, and there is opcode specific witness. So step context, uh, by saying that it's a context variable for each step. So, so you need to put some context related variables, for example, like when you're executing the step, what's your code hash, what's your guest remaining, what's your parent counter, what's your stack pointer, what's your state root, and uh, those stuff. And the key switch, uh, we'll select, you know, which opcode you are using. It can be opcode, and it, it just, you know, indicates uh, what kind of functionality you have for this step. So, for example, if step three is for 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 add, then like you need to open this add selector, and if it's an error case, it's error 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 handling, then like you know, you, you need to put some other states here, and uh, so exactly one one variable in this area will be one. So for this as add, for if you if it's add add then you put this to be one and other like variable to be to be zero and uh, it's binary and uh, for opcode specific witness uh it's you to to prove that certain like logic for, specific to this opcode for example if you want to prove add you need to prove a plus b equal to c right so you need your operands here you need maybe some carries when you are proving this large large word um you need like operand carry all the leaves and you need to put your specific logic here now let's take a look at some constraints, some custom case you are you are actually using for those for constraining those those relationships. So one day that's uh, for for this step context. So step context basically proving consistency between two steps. So you, uh, I just have another like you know uh, the the first line of of the, the the next step here, and you are basically defining custom case over this as what well, as what well, so basically this constraint is saying that oh okay so if if add op, op, uh, if if this opcode is add, then program counter should plus one. Like so, so basically this cascade the shape is look like you 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 get this er this variable, this variable, and this variable. It's something like this. The, the gate is look like this. And second is that uh, your your s add times this stack pointer stack pointer and equal to one. So basically you are defining very irregular like uh, custom gates to link to two different steps and using this s add as selector. And for key switch, you first need to prove that you know all the elements are binary, and then you need to prove that adding them together you get one because only one element will be select will be switched on. 
And for some optical specific witness, you need to prove that, okay, so if it's add, then like, you know, this A times B, like maybe with some carry equal to, to, to zero, and this is low bit, this is high bit, and something like that. Um, so this is a constraints, like you have multiple constraints, like for, for different, uh, like for, for add, for sub, you have different constraints for this, but those those can be shared, like case switch and sub contact can be shared because it's, it's global. Uh, any so don't, don't you have, don't you have to have to also have to prove that s add and s mole are bi are binary zero one? Yeah yeah yeah. So this is exactly for. Oh yes yes. So that's in there. Yes yes. Sorry I missed it. And then what do you do for the gas? Don't you have to like have like a big if statement depending on what what instruction is being executed? The gas changes differently. Yeah yeah yeah. Exactly. So this is like why. Oh yeah. Have... Sorry, you already wrote it. I missed it. My my mistake. Sorry. Please go. Please continue. <laughs> sorry, it's my fault. Like you know, I compressed too much information in one slide and like you know, going through too fast. Yeah. Oh. Any more questions? Okay, yeah. Okay, so now another thing like, you know, we need to prove that after constraining this, you know, step, like context is the same, uh, opcode is, is constrained properly. Another thing we need to constrain is that the operand itself is cons consistent, right? So for example, if, if you are proving for this add opcode, um, the operand you are using like, you know, A, B, and C, you need to prove that it's actually already being pushed by previous operations, right? So it's consistent elements. And so uh, to achieve this, instead of writing all the constraints inside this, like, you know, EVM circuits, we, that's, a, that's where we are using this lookup table. So we separate a lookup table. Imagine this is just some, some lookup columns. And uh, we assume that this table already contain all the correct entries for each, for, for, so for the operands at each step. And uh, then like, you know, in EVM circuits, we didn't prove that. We just proved that, okay, so, these elements belong to this table with, with this tag. And these elements belong to this, this table with this tag. And we didn't handle anything like inside the EVM circuits. But we just imagine that there are some magic table which storing all the correct entries. And uh, you know, the operands at certain type just believe like belong to this, this table. And now the problem becomes, you know, the table is magic, right? Like in practice, how you how you prove that you know this table is consistent itself. Um, so we have a separate uh, like RAM circuit to constrain in that all the entries inside this RAM circuit is cra generated correctly with the correct order. And uh, so this is how you, how you handle like stack, memory, and storage. So you basically, so the, I, I think it's may, maybe too detailed and uh, like maybe can't fit into this time slot, but a quick introduction is that, you know, uh, when you are, so if you are thinking of the execution order from step one to step n, then like your, the, the, the order for operand is like totally random, right? It's not, can't be sorted by stack, memory and story, right? It can be like, you know, in step one, you are doing some stack operations, step two, maybe memory operations. So this tag should be random according to a concrete execution trace, right? So that's your initial trace table. But here, like you, you get a different table, which you sort these elements according to the tag, like the operations you are doing, like, you know, you put stack operations together, you put memory operations together, you put storage operations together, and then you prove that this sorted table is a permutation of your previous trace table. And then you prove that this, this sorted table has some certain property, like, you know, wh why we are doing this? Because, you know, if you put stack operations together, then it's easier to prove that, you know, the elements are consistent, right? You just need to prove that uh, two adjacent rows, like, you know, it's consistent. Like if previous is right to the, to the same address, then like, you know, it's the same if, 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 uh, if it's a read, then it's the same. If it's right, then like, you know, it's need to, to change and uh, have something constrained over that. So it's easier if you put the same tag and same address together after sorting. But in your initial like execution trace is totally random. So this is basically some logic inside RAM circuit. And the initial idea like is a, is a paper like uh, from maybe eight years ago called Tiny RAM. And they, they, they handle this like, you know, virtual machine circuit by, you know, separating into execution and uh, some some like memory, and they sort this memory prove using some switching network, um, and then like you know prove that consistency for those entries. Yeah, uh, hope that makes sense. Uh, any questions for mm -hmm. this? Yeah, okay. Um, and uh, similarly, like you know, when you need to prove some very large and zeky unfriendly opcode like hush, because you can't prove definitely can't prove a catch hack logic within one step, right? You, you need a very large and concrete specific logic. So what you do it? What we do is that we just put this input and hash off this input directly in the EVM circuit uh, and prove and imagine that there is a like you know magic again like magic hash lookup table uh, which store all the all the correct entries for input and output pair uh, and then we directly do a lookup 
from this entry to this lookup table and assume that this lookup table containing all the correct entries. And to prove it's correct, again, like, you know, you need to prove that uh, using a hash circuit. So this, in this circuit is also dynamic entries. Now it's different from fixed field because, you know, it's easier to, uh, to brute force all the possible entries for bitwise operations for range proofs, right? Because you just brute force all. But for hash, you definitely can't do that because you, you know input can be random. It, it can be arbitrary long, right? So that's why, like you know, we only prove the hash entry pairs we use. So imagine that there are two two columns, and the first column store all the input, and the second column uh, store all the all the output. And the, there is a hash logic defined in some other 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 columns, and define and proving that all those like entries stored in those two columns are correct in this hash circuit. It, you, you can prove uh, basically, for example, n hashes in one circuit and prove all those n hashes are correct. And then like, you know, doing lookup from this to those dynamic generated tables. Yeah, if that makes sense. Uh, any questions so far? This, this hash circuit is not, this is not a custom gate, right? The hash circuit itself is implemented as many, many gates. Uh, Yes. So, but but you can still use the custom gate logic to to write this hash hash circuit. Like you know, you can you can. But but yeah yeah, you can you can definitely use arbitrary things to prove that those hash entries are correct. Okay. But but here, like we are still using this Planckian optimization, which means you know it's still a table layout defining some custom gate for this hash. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. And yeah. And so the architecture for the EVM circuits will look like this. So on top of that, there is the EVM circuit to constraining this state machine is correct. Like it moves correctly from state one to state two. And then like, you know, in EVM circuit, because there are so many, they can find any opcodes and something like that. You just imagine that there is a batch of magic tables, like for example, fixed table. So this, this table can be, can be, this is the only table which can be pre-processed, which is easier for you to do some bitwise opcodes, range check. So you, when, you, when, you, when you are doing that, you just look up into this table. And there is a table for catch check, like, you know, when you are doing shard three, when you are doing potentially doing some storage, you just look up into this catch up table. And then there is a RAM table, like when you're doing stack memory and uh, storage operations, you look look up into this RAM table and there are bytecode table, transaction table, block context table, all those tables. Uh, and uh, because to prove that those, those tables are correct, because fixed table, you can pre-process that. You don't need to prove that it's correct. To prove that those tables are correct, you need to prove that, you know, for them, there is a catch up circuit proving that all the entries in catch table are correct. And uh, there is an MPT circuit proving that, you know, the storage operation is correct, but MPT also rely on catch So it will also look into this catch table. And there is RAM circuit, there is bytecode circuit, also like you, because you need to like uh, compute the, the code hash. And there is a transaction circuit, block circuit, ECDS circuit, all those stuff. So this is the architecture for, for the given circuits. It's actually composed of many circuits, each used for different purposes, and they are linked by this table. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. Um, and uh, now let's take a like just a glance of the, the performance because people worry about this performance a lot. So uh, in, in reality, in what we deploy is, so there are EVM circuit, RAM circuit, all those sub circuits, but each circuit will generate proof, right? Because you know, you are proving like some circuit using one proof and uh, you definitely don't want to prove many proofs on chain, right? Because it's super inefficient and each proof needs some like pairing and verification. So we have an aggregation circuit, which aggregates all the proofs into one proof so that it can further reduce its on-chain verification cost. And uh, so you, you, we have this layered architecture. So the first layer need to be really expressive. So for example, EVM circuits, uh, it, because it's directly proving that EVM logic, RAM logic, storage logic. So it can, it's, it's, it's directly handling your program logic. So, and uh, EVM circuit, has uh, like, you know, one, over 100 columns and a whole, like, you know, over 2000 custom gates and 50 lookups. And the highest custom gate degree is nine. So it's not like, you know, I'm mentioning that you can use arbitrary uh, degree of custom gate, but this custom gate degree will bring you some problem because, you know, it, it will more 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 exactly, it, it will introduce in hyperplank there is no such problem, but in, in, in normal plank, if you need FFT, uh, if you are using higher custom gate degree, you need a larger size cost FFT to, to perform some, some computation for those polynomials. And uh, for, for around 1 million guys, this EVM circuit needs like two powers, 18 rows. And the more guys you need, the more rows you. So you, yeah, can you, can you explain, this is actually something that uh, would be helpful to understand. Like what, what is it, um, how do you decide uh, when something could, should be made into a custom gate? Like what? What causes you to decide that you have you had to have a particular custom gate of degree nine? What? What? 
Is it because because that operation appeared many times in the circuit, or how do you decide that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a very good question. So basically, in ZKVM circuits, every constraints you need to write are custom gate, and you need to design like you know all the all the application logic for ads and for those stuff. Because you know, think of the standard Planck, like right. Uh, I'm, I'm like you, assuming you asking the comparison between a standard Planck, which for example yeah. you use a standard like five audacity gate, and you you can uh, use this that standard pattern for every operation, and then you use permutation to link those those gates, right? But the problem for, for that pattern is that you need permutation to link different like gates. But for the key EVM, uh, I will have a like separate slides like later to explain this, but uh, just a quick uh, explanation because for, for, for different execution traits, uh, you will you will result like you know if you if you look at this. So if you if you have like different sequence of execution traits, you will result in totally different constraints in each step. So the layout will change according to your execution traits if you are using standard Planck because 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 this step like for for step n you don't know like which opcode you are proving like during the runtime and you need some permutation like for example if if you want to link this is add this sub and if you are using st standard Planck pattern uh, you might link need to link those those two those two like you know opcodes uh, like in some way using some permutation but if if changes in the last step then like you, you need to change your permutation it's, which is bad because for different transactions you need to like you have different circuits. So to make this circuit become really universal, um, like we, we have to use custom gates for every constraint we write. And we basically can't reuse any constraints. And uh, if that's, yeah, it's, 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 it's hard to explain, but the, basically the intuition is that you can't use permutation in, in a virtual machine based circuit because this dynamic execution step and you can't link you like, you know, as you do in standard Planck. And that's why like, you know, we have to use like a bunch of custom gates to, to constrain in this. And uh, so we abstract this into some IR, like, you know, for, 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 for different ad, you, you have like, you know, multiple constraints for ad and uh, then reuse this only like on the IR level, if that makes sense. It's uh -huh. just hard to reuse in this virtual machine pattern. So, so is, it, is it fair to say that for every one, is, is it correct to say that for every opcode, you mm -hmm. basically you have, you have a custom gate that implements that opcode? Uh, uh, you have actually, yeah, you have actually a set of custom gates with lower degree. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, then you use this, like, you know, selector, this ad, for example, this ad, then like, you use this as selector to open, you know, a bunch of, so if you, if you look at this, so this ad is the, the selector and uh, this is a bunch of custom gates you have for ad. Oh, like, I see. You know, yeah. This PC is for ad specific logic, right? Because only ad, then your PC plus one, stack pointer plus one, gas plus three. And, uh, but for other, like, you know, maybe PC plus plus differently and stack pointer plus differently, right? So this is already like add specific logic using custom gate and your custom gate shape will look like you, you circle this, circle this and circle this. And mm -hmm. then this, if this is gas, then like, you know, you circle this, circle this, circle this. This is your custom gate shape. And this is also part of the custom gate inside add because it's add specific logic. And you need to multiply with this add selector because it's only, if it's only add, then you are applying this, this constraint. I see. I see. Okay. Good. Good. That helps. Okay. Okay. And uh, yeah. Okay. Let me see. Okay. And uh, and uh, so another factor which influences your custom gates degree is that uh, you know if you have like think of if you have very high degree custom gates uh, if you have a times b times c uh, in the back end it will translate to a x times b x times c x and that's why you can't have too too high degree like your custom gates because if you times a x times b x times c x times d x you need uh, like you know you, you need a FFT size to be like four times your degree, right? Because you, you are multiplying four, polynom four polynomials. So if you have too high degree, then you, you, your FFT will just be too large. And this is a smaller problem, which, you know, hyperplunk so properly because you can use like higher custom gate degree without doing those like very high costly FFT operations. Yeah. And for a million gas, this table had like two powers, 18 rows. And the more gas, the more rows you have. And for aggregation circuit, it has a like smaller number of columns, smaller number of custom gates, smaller number of lookups. And the reason is that because the proof from aggregation circuit need to be verified on Ethereum. And the verification cost is linear to uh, like how many column you have. So you, you want to reduce this. So the optimization goal for this is that you will try to optimize how many columns you have and optimize for the verification cost. And so you have a like lower custom gate degree and for, for aggregating like multiple proofs, uh, like, you know, for example, for aggregating four, four circuits, they need two powers, like 24 rows. 
And this won't increase with, with gas increasing because uh, regardless of, so gas will only influence how many rows you have in, in the first layer, but, but on the second layer, it's only proof for this constant proof and it won't be influenced. Um, any questions for this slide? Yeah, just a quick question. Um, <clears throat> when you talk about the, the linearity of the, of the, of the, the gate degree versus gas, is, are there any situations where that wouldn't be a linear relationship that come to mind? Um, I, that was a question I wanted to ask, and you answered that linear um, uh, answer, but uh, just wondering if, if that ever changes based on maybe yeah. the um, the the permutations or the way you yeah. set up the permutations and the execution stack. Um, this is Jim in New Zealand. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a good question. So when I'm talking about one million gas, it needs this number of rows, like two million double. Uh, it's talking about the average case. It's not definitely not the like you know exact case because, for example, like you know for for catch hack, it definitely needs it's a smaller gas, but it has a larger proving cost, so it definitely needs more operations. And so it's just average case, but it differs according to a concrete execution trees. And we can only use some rough estimation for like you know average, uh, like what's the average uh, like you know uh, row number for for one gas, and then like get this number. It's not directly linear, but it's on average, it's, it's roughly like this because we, we are directly mocking some manet block and uh, doing some average case, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Th uh, thank you for that, Yi. Okay. Um, and sorry, also, and like, for, uh, sorry to keep interrupting, but I am very curious. So, for 1 million gas, how long does it actually, uh, or for 2 to the 18 rows, how long does it actually take to generate the proof? Yeah, this is exactly this. the next slide oh, I'm yeah. talking about this, this performance side. So yeah, and besides, like as I mentioned, like you know, because Prover is highly optimized, highly parallelizable. So we build a very fast GPU prover. We will have some paper and S plus like uh, coming out very soon, and which we implement this MS kernel, NTT kernel, and a quotient kernel to to make the core compute computation really fast. And also we we do some pipeline and overlap between CPU and GPU computation. And also we have multi card implementation, do some, a bunch of memory optimization. And uh, the the performance is significant. Like you know, for EM circuits for one million gas, this is all talking about one million gas. So the CPU pura takes like over 200 uh, seconds and GPU tour only takes 30 seconds. And for aggregation circuits, the CPU pura takes over 2000 seconds and GPU pura only takes like over 100 seconds. It's almost like 15 times speed up. So actually the aggregation circuit become a larger bottleneck because you are like using too many, too, like too many rows and uh, like, you know, the, the degree and the operation you are doing is, is more. And so for one million gas, the first layer, like, you know, because it's not only EVM circuits, it takes roughly like two minutes to generate proof for, for the first layer for one million gas. And second layer, you will take three minutes. And so it's not that, you know, slow, like for one million gas, you just need five, five, five minutes to generate proof. But in, in our test net, it might take longer because we, we, we just open up like, you know, three or uh, not, not three, like I think over 10, 10 provers by our, running by ourselves currently running, it's a small cluster. So it might be, you know, like this, uh, our proving might didn't catch this, you know, like this, this uh, because it, we just have very limited prover computation power. But once we open this to be decentralized prover uh, and more, more people are joining, prover won't be a big bottleneck. And, uh, and also like, because this depends on concrete, like, you know, for, for real test net, it depends on like this withdrawal and the finality time depends on how many transactions you have. You can't have like, you know, 1 million gas always. You might wait a for, for a longer time to, for more transactions to, to be included in one proof. Uh, any questions so, for this? Hey, um, I had a quick question. What is the size of the RAM that you're using for these? Uh, it seemed to be pretty memory loaded. I was kind of curious to see. Yes, yes, that's a good question. So I covered that in very last slide, but basically the CPU RAM is over 500 gigabytes. Uh, and the GPU is a, has a relatively lower requirement. It's only required GPU to have like eight gigabytes uh, like memory, so you you can you can use some low end GPUs, but you the CPU requirement is very very high because you need to do witness generation, you need to do all those like some operations still on CPU. Does that make sense? Or... Yep, that helped. Thank you so much. Yeah, and similarly, I think Polygon Hermes also use very very large like CPU with over five hundred gigabytes like memory. Yeah. Okay. So that's basic. Actually, hey, yeah, I have a question. Uh, is there people using like FPGA or even ASIC uh, yes. to, uh, to achieve like higher uh, performance here? Yes, 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 there are. There are. So uh, like 
we we have actually done like you know some uh, some academic work called PEPDIC. If you search the uh, online paper, it's uh, ESCA paper talking about how you use ASIC structure or architecture to to make poor faster. And in industry, there are some some like uh, work from like uh, different companies. There are like Angoyama, Yuvitana, like you know like all those companies building uh, FPGA prover. And uh, I know there are some like Axel, Cesic, some companies building some ASIC prover. Um, and uh, like you know. Yeah, definitely some some efforts from both industry and academia making that faster. And they have some open source benchmark, and you can check out that on check out their paper. And yeah, got it. Thank you. Yeah, can you can you say also which one is the bottleneck? Is it the MSM or is it the NTT? So yeah, so that's a very good question. So MSM is really easy to parallel because it's so straightforward. Uh, and NTT has a like pretty random access pattern, but the problem is that. You know, if people that, that's a, that's also some something I which I want to mention, like in, in research part, because people usually think, you know, if we remove this entity part, we can make this prover become really parallelizable and really fast. But you know, uh, unfortunately, the problem is that for the same size of MSM and NTT, NTT in practice is just ten times faster than multi initialization because MSM is just too computational heavy. It involves too much group operation. So we believe that using ASIC, you can make MSM become significantly faster. Uh, because ASIC is really good for those computational heavy stuff. But for NTT, it's already like, you know, bottlenecked by this bandwidth. It's not bound by the computation. Think of this, like, you know, if you are doing a two powers 26 set FFT and uh, on GPU, if you're, so your, your, your computation time, if I remember correctly, is around like 100 milliseconds. And uh, 80 milliseconds is spent on copying this data from CPU to GPU and a copy back from GPU to, C to oh. CPU. And your computation is just, 20 milliseconds. So it's just, you know, bounded by this memory copy. So you might, maybe with FPJ, you can use some like special device like HBM or something to optimize this. And from MSM, the problem is that, you know, it's just too computational heavy, even if it's so parallel. So I believe that maybe using ASIC, you can make that faster. And uh, more importantly, after our GPU optimization, MS, both MSM and NTT uh, like lowered from like, you know, 90% of the proving time uh, reduce that to like maybe maybe like twenty percent of of the proving time. So the new bottleneck, especially for large circuit, become weakness generation, like oh. which is like very surprising. But yeah, it's unfortunately it's, it's true. But huh. yeah. Uh, any more questions for this slide? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so so I will just go through those like research problems really really quickly because I know, <laughs> I'm trying to control my time if. Um, yeah, um, and so I will firstly go through some protocol level research, and next I will go through some security research. Um, yeah, so if you look at look back at the our architecture, um, even if our prover is sufficiently decentralized, there is still a coordinator, so it's still half decentralized because your centralization totally relies on this coordinator, and also se sequencer currently is 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 centralized. So we want to decentralize the whole architecture and de achieve decentralization, like in every stack of our, our network. So one thing like for decentralization is that you can just let a node run in both sequencer and prover and have some co consensus over this. But the problem is that first proving time is super long and uh, proving hardware is customized. So you will be less decentralized because only very few people can run in this node. And a similar work to embed this zero proof inside consensus like ALU or proof of necessary work um, there are some some solutions like that, but it's also based on proof of work, which you know for for some people it's bad in terms of like you know Ethereum turns to POS and Roap can do use POSW again. It needs some level of, so and also like for Roap it doesn't need that that much level of decentralization. So that's a problem for this design. Like you know if you put the sequencer and prover together, and another solution is that you can just separate that. You, you can just you know having some party running the sequencer and uh, sequencing the transaction and put this transaction order on on chain. And then you have another party which you can also see the proof generation to a special like minor community. And uh, so your sequencer can be decentralized and no need to use customized hardware and prover can be more centralized, but require some, you know, like IPJ, GPU or ASIC. Um, but there, there are definitely some, some, some challenges here. Like, you know, we, because one tricky thing here is that if you let everyone, anyone to, to submit the proof, uh, you know, it, it, you know, like some, it, 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 it has some better influence because uh, if you you are using ASIC prover and you have very strong like computation power, then you will dominate the, the whole network. Because if, for example, if you are normal people, you, you use GPU and you can't you, you are always defeated by this ASIC. Then like you know there is a, a problem called fast prover always win, and you definitely don't want to. At least we don't want 
to this to happen because um, it means our whole system will, will rely on this fastest prover and it's really less decentralized. If this prover one day go down, then like, you know, because no one else is running this prover because it can't, can't get incentivized. So um, it has some problems here. So we want to avoid this problem. Um, and also like in, in a centralized setting, we can outsource blocks to different provers. So in centralized setting, how we are solving this problem is that we can outsource blocks to different provers and set some fixed window saying that, okay, so if you if you can send back the proof in time window T, then you can get some reward. So the strategy for the prover to maximum their profit should be generate proof in parallel instead of being the fastest one. Because even if you, you generate proof really fast, you, it's still within that time window, like they can generate proof really slowly and still get that reward. So it's still benefit, it's more beneficial for improving the network throughput and the maximum using the, the prover computation power across the network. And uh, but 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 in this case, it's easier to risk. Um and um, in some sense it's good because you have the shortest proving time because you are incentivizing the, the fast one. But in practice, like you know, no one is really, you know, after they, they defeat other like other people, why they are keeping improving their stuff, like you know, they have no incentive to build this. So it's really bad. And also you rely on the single party. Another tricky thing is that you know the incentive model become more complicated because if you are only one party, you can get all the reward, but this need to be divided before the sequencer reward and the prover reward. So it makes the, this mechanism design more, more complicated. And another tricky thing is need to be considered in practice that, that you also need to consider the aggregation for, for multiple proofs. So which might make the workflow more, more complicated. So that's one on the protocol side, like you know how you decentralize this, this prover. And second thing I want to quickly mention is that you know people keep marketing this as layer three, like you know oh okay so you build a layer two which you know verify proof on, on layer one and then you can build some layer three on top of uh, which means you can verify proofs uh, on layer two. So this sounds like it make a lot of sense like this hyper hyperscaling stuff like you know you build keep building layers and which you get get the scaling benefit. But the problem you really need to think is that does it really make sense or is, is that just marketing or it, it makes really sense in, in practice? Because there are some dilemma because if you, for layer three, if your data is posted on layer one, then you don't get much savings because you are still bond, like bonded by this data availability. Um, but if your data is not posted on layer one, it's only verification cost. Why just not? Why, why, why just? Why, why don't just you build a layer two and aggregate proofs and into one proof to to save the verification cost? So there is this dilemma, like you know, why you really need to build layer threes? No, I mean, and, the, uh, the, the the answer is that you, you you want you might want different architectures for your different layer threes. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's listed here, like you know, some potential reason. Like oh, you know, some yeah. for first, some acquisition want to run their own sequencer because they don't want to rely on. Um, only on your sequencer, they want to some social consensus and something like that. And secondly, that you can customize this execution environment that go beyond EVM. Like, you know, it's not only EVM. And also like maybe you can do cheaper and uh, uh, like deposit and withdraw from layer two. And also maybe you can have like your composability between layer three. But, you know, all those benefits still like, you know, you can still build some customized engines using in a layer two setting if, if you know, considering this dilemma. So it's still like, you know, tricky, like, you know, who will really build something on top of layer two besides this strong, like, you know, marketing stuff like you know yeah something like that and uh, so there are some design considerations behind layer 3 research like for example your trust assumptions your security liveness and uh, like how you are running your sequencer and also like i think for layer 3 what we really need to consider is the uh, the, the developers and what what should we build for them and also there are some traditional problems like you know there is a liquidity split among multiple layer tools for example there are three layer tools and each develop like maybe a deploy uniswap but but you know, it's like we, we all have our own state route. We, we all have our own state route, and uh, there are some liquidity split up among like you know different layer tools. And uh, and uh, some some DeFi's uh, choose to not deploy on multi chain because of uh, this liquidity split. So maybe there are some better ways to, to solve that, uh, like on the protocol level. But we don't know. And uh, yeah, another thing I want to mention for this like you know layer two protocol research is this resource pricing. So if you think of EVM or transactional Ethereum layer one, so how you are like, you know, price resources according to your bandwidth, which means your data download need to download and your computation, which means you, you need to execute transactions and some storage stuff because you need to store some transactions, um, either history transaction or some permanent state. But for the key EVM, um, the, the computation and storage will, will, will change because computation actually uh, relies on part of that rely on your, you know, your proving cost, which is different from this execution cost. Especially for Kachak, like you know, your proving versus like execution is much larger, and uh, you know, but so so it means you know Kachak need to be repriced because Zeki EVM has a larger over proving overhead for for this, and uh, there are some like you know people saying that there are some way to to solve this on a protocol level, 
Um, but but I, at, at least you know, like from from what we research, like you know, if you keep this, for example, you you keep minting tokens to 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 compensate, like you know, you, this this higher pooling cost. But it's 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 maybe bad for the for your whole system to 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 go in this way, and you you maybe have to repress this according to your real resource used and for storage, like because there is a core data cost. Um, and so there might be some different like you know pricing mechanism for for the KVM. And uh, yeah, so th these are like something new, like for for on the protocol side. So, so just to quickly summarize for protocol research, like how you decentralize sequencer and prover. There is challenges on protocol design, mechanism design, and maybe some questions related to the MEV and enforced transaction order. And for layer three, and uh, think about the the real reasons and some design design considerations and some some liquidity splitting, some resource pricing. So that's some some problems which. You know, it's not specific to us, but I think in, in general to, to this layer two space. Um, yeah, I think, yeah. And next I will go over, quickly go over some like ZK research uh, like problem. So for circuit, so um, so as I mentioned, like, you know, EVM has a very large word size, like 256. And it even can't be like, you know, expressed just in one cell because one cell is only uh, a prime number on, on your like, you know, scalar field of EV curve. Which is usually like 254 bit for for being curve and for some BIS curve, so it's so 256 is larger than what one cell can express. So you need to decompose this into multiple leaves, and then like you know what we do is that you use some randomness to linear combine like you know the 32 eight leaf. So you 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 chunk that into 32 eight leaf, uh, eight bit leaves, and then you linear combine that into one value, and then like every time you need to use this word, you can just use this one cell instead of you know unrolling that to all the cells. But the problem here is that you know theta is a randomness and it's derived, so it should be computed after a zero to a thirty one is fixed. So you need to have something. So, but but it's like you know everything is part of the witness, right? If you you are directly using your initial uh, prover, then like you know everything is part of the witness. So you might need to have some multi-phase prover, which means you you synthesize part of the witness, you derive something, and then like you know you, you generate the other part of the witness. And uh, so, what's to mention that this ROC random linear combination is used for in many places. This, this in, what, what I call like in circuit randomness, it's because it can compress EVM word into one value. It can encode dynamic lens of input, especially for catch check, right? Because you can have dynamic lens of input, and also for some lookup optimizations, because you can combine multiple values into one and look up that in using this one value. And but 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 it really influences the poor, poor efficiency and in our. Uh, real circuit, we, we might also consider to use some other ways to, to avoid this. But this is just very interesting technique. And if you are a researcher, you can think of some other applications to figure out whether this is really useful or not. And there is circuit layout. And as like, you know, then I had asked previously, like, you know, why like we are using so many custom gates, why we are not reusing the same, uh, like, you know, maybe one or two custom gates and just keep reusing that. Because, uh, you know, for each step, you need to enable different constraints. And the permutation is not fixed, so you need dynamic permutation across those steps. Like for, for like so so it's 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 hard to reuse those standard gates. And in our ZK EVM, we, we even don't use permutation because you you can't have any pre-processing. And that's the reason why we have like two or two thousand custom gates, and we use different rotations like you know to access this irregular uh, shaped gate. And maybe there are some better way to lay out like for them like Hermit. Um, like it's hard to compare the trade-off, but what Hermes is doing is that they are using some like you know micro, uh, like they call that ZK assembly, and they they only write circuits for their ZK assembly uh, like instructions, and then for each step they also break down to like a smaller state machine using like represented using those uh, ZK assembly uh, like you know instructions in the middle and then constraints work only constrain those smaller set of instructions. So that might be one way you can think of so. Uh, one way to think of that is just you know another virtual machine which interpret EVM, but another way to think of that is just you know using this state machine to solve this permutation problem because you know if you think of the comparison between Stark, Stark and uh, and and the Planck, so Planck has permutation to link different gates, right? It has co copy constraints, it has this wiring constraints, but for Stark, uh, it it requires you to only access the next the adjacent row and do some state transition. And then like you don't need this permutation. So that's why like people usually think, you know, this stock stuff is usually is better for building virtual machine, but actually you can also do that in Planckish stuff because you, you just need to initiate your custom gate to be just two adjacent rows. Yeah. So that's for circuit layout and maybe there are some better way to lay out this. Uh, anyway. Okay. Um, 
just a few slides. So sorry for being too long. And uh, so there are some some challenges on the plural side. Like you know, there is a, like you know, for example, our plural uh, or GPU can make uh, multi exponentiation FFT really fast, but the bottleneck move to recent generation and data copy. And also we need a very large CPU memory, which is over 500 gigabytes. And maybe there are some more hardware friendly prover, like by saying that, I mean, both parallel ball and low peak memory. And also like don't ignore the witness generation. It takes really a significant part in, in improved generation. And also like how we can run on cheap machines and become more, more decentralized. And aggregation is that, you know, like how you choose. So the first layer you can use general proof. Second layer, you also need to generate proof to aggregate multiple proofs. But those two layers might use different proofing system. And maybe there are some better way to compose different proof systems. Like, you know, for example, first layer need to be expressive. It need to have custom gate lookup support, um, something customized. It need to be hardware friendly. Uh, verification circuit need to be small. But the second is more like, you know, the verifier algorithm should be easily to be verified on EVM. And th th those are some recommended uh, candidates like Plunky2, Sarky2, Halo2 for the first layer. And maybe there are some new IOPs with IFFTs like, like Hyperplunk. And there are some linear time prover in collaboration based on this uh, like linear error, error correcting code. And the second layer, there are growth team and some other, other constructions. Yeah, so this is for prover and aggregation. And for secure, security, like, you know, I, I take this screenshot from Vitalik because, you know, it contains like over 30K uh, so 37 line of code for writing this very complicated human circuits. Uh, it, it's not going to be bug free for quite a, quite a long time, even for like, regardless of which project you are working on, regardless of which, like how marketing you, you are aggressive, like, you know, oh, our document is so secure. It won't be secure for quite a long time. So what's a better way to, for this auditing this human circuits? Um, and uh, in general, it's like, you know, abstracting this problem into some virtual machine circuit based on some IR. And uh, currently most people are doing this manually. And maybe we can do, and currently we are doing some exploration with companies like doing this form of vacation for some of codes, but it's very hard to, to do that for the whole circuit. And also like, you know, better way to read about the security, like, you know, the, the whole system security, like, you know, for example, we, we introduced the randomness and whether that's in, in, the inference soundness. And also like, you know, we, we, we need to design some mechanism if, what if we really need some constraints and what's a bad thing that the attacker can really do and design some more secure like evaluation for, for the whole project. And so just a quick summary for, 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 for ZK research, like, you know, your circuit can be improved like by better layout, better prime to and building blocks, and the prover can be improved by better proof system and aggregation, and maybe software hardware called design to design some hardware friendly algorithms. And also security can be improved by reading about the, 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 the audit and maybe some form of on the, especially for product level system. Uh, yeah, it's just, just two, two, sorry, but just two, two last slides. And finally, like just, just a quick summary, like, you know, we are, we are building a lot of things at Scroll. So Scroll is general purpose screen source for Ethereum based on ZK Rob. And we are building a native ZK EVM using very advanced circuit optimization plus new proof systems. And we are building very fast provers through hardware acceleration and uh, GPU in production, especially GPU in production and proof recursion. And we are live on testnet um, uh, with a product level robust infrastructure. And uh, there are a bunch of interesting problems to be solved on the protocol design level, mechanism design level, and there are some on the ZK side, like ZK engineer and research for practical efficiency. Um, and uh, hopefully, like, you know, we're, we're still hiring and check out the, the hiring page. And uh, sorry, sorry for the advertisement, but yeah, I think that's, that's all for, for, for today. Um, 